Common Mystic Prayer, Gabriel Diefenbach, Chapter 12, Accompanying Effects of This Prayer. As contemplative prayer brings about such a marked change in the manner of the soul's interior operation, it is natural that there should be a corresponding modification all along the line of the spiritual course. The entire life is affected. The inner result is a wonderful simplifying and unifying of the soul's activities. Our merely natural bent is toward multiplicity, whether in temporal or in spiritual things. This is now checked under the influence of simple prayer, which attracts the soul more and more to simplicity in everything. The action of the Holy Spirit ever tends to draw the soul away from multiplicity, whether inwardly, to lead it gently to the unity that is himself, or outwardly, to seek the one thing needful. The great desire of the soul is to be ever finding its Lord in the loving repose of prayer. Contemplation has become its main exercise, the central longing of its heart. To this, all other occupations are subordinated. Duties are now done not so much out of the natural enthusiasm that springs from self as out of the supernatural love engendered in simple prayer. God has come to fill the consciousness of the soul to be its very all. In the beginning, this effect is so pronounced that the soul longs to be alone, away, in solitude, desiring neither to hear, know, or speak of anything of this world. These matters have become strange to it. Hence, we find written in the spiritual journal of Lucy Christine the revealing account which Father Poulain has edited. What makes the soul really suffer is when one is obliged to lend one's attention to some banal worldly conversation. The soul then feels ill at ease, estranged by all the insignificant things she hears, and to which she must make some reply. She compares these empty words to the divine silence of the church and of the tabernacle, and the heart is homesick for the altar. God's own working in the soul has estranged it from sensible and temporal things to give it a taste for the divine. The only satisfying diet is the general, obscure, loving knowledge of himself that God is infusing into it. It relishes only peace, quiet, and whatever tends to the calm of recollection. After some period, shorter or longer, in certain cases, extending over several years, when it has become accustomed to its new prayer, it once again adjusts itself to the particular. Yet it remains detached, for it sees and handles all under the light of a deeper faith. And precisely because the soul is detached from all things and attached only to God and His holy will, it can find a higher kind of use and appreciation of created things. They do not now absorb the soul and entangle it in affections and allurements that tend to upset the passions and promote sense activities. There is also some outward manifestation of this inward simplicity and unity of spirit. It affects not only the bearing and conduct generally, but even the matter of devotions. Since to be at peace before God is the soul's one desire, its former multifarious practices will be reduced to simplification. The Master himself is leading it to the more continuous operation of love wherein all else is absorbed. Thus, if it has hitherto practiced what is known as the particular examine, it now finds a difficulty in doing so. The same repugnance it experiences in exciting its faculties to meditate is felt in examining the conscious and analyzing its motives and actions. However, this is more than compensated for by the mystic prayer which throws immediate light on the soul's conduct and causes it distinct pain the moment it commits a voluntary fault. As it lives now constantly in the will of God, whatever is contrary to that holy will becomes grievous to it. 
And this growing union with its spouse, which persists throughout the day, renders it ever watchful, lest it offend him in anything, however small. Here again, what could scarcely be achieved by one's own effort, readings and reflections, is now wrought almost without labor by the power emanating from interior prayer. Again, this simplification applies even in the matter of explicit intentions made in prayer. Some souls are reduced to such a loving simplicity in things spiritual as to dwell, so to say, in the very atmosphere of love. It is difficult for them to form particular intentions. Their distaste for doing so may at first distress them until they arrive at a truer understanding of prayer. The case comes to mind of a person who was long led to contemplation without suspecting it. This person was working against the call of grace for several years by forcing endless particular acts and devotions, not only in an effort to enkindle some feeling of fervor, but especially with a view to liberating the soul of a deceased relative. This apparently was the substance of the prayer life, and it was hindering progress if not causing a distaste for prayer. When this person was instructed how to correspond with the action of the Holy Spirit, everything became clear, and a new and simplified spiritual life began. Such persons may think they are not helping departed relatives and friends without making explicit applications and intentions. But they must come to understand that their new way of prayer is the way of unceasing love, and is so vastly pleasing to the heavenly spouse, the infinitely generous divine lover, that he will grant all and more than they could obtain in particular intentions. For this God of all consolation, who searches the reins and the heart, is delighted to anticipate the intentions and requests of the loving soul. So we are not to force ourselves, but must ever yield to the sweet operations of love, not making any more interior acts than we feel impelled to under the impulse of the Spirit of God. The state of a soul so well established in contemplation that this is used habitually in prayer is excellently described by Father Grau, one of the finest spiritual writers of the 18th century. He says, Everything, therefore, that God does to a soul to make it holy, has for its first object to make it simple. And all the cooperation he requires from that soul is that it should allow itself to be torn from every kind of multiplicity to pass on to a state of simplicity. When, therefore, a soul has given herself entirely to God, he simplifies her, first of all, in the very depths of her nature by placing there a principle of infused, and supernatural love, which becomes the simple and only motive of her whole conduct. She refers everything to this love without even thinking expressly about it. God makes her simple in her understanding. The multitude of thoughts that formerly embarrassed her ceases. During this time she can no longer meditate or reason or speak. A light that is simple, though indistinct, enlightens her. The soul is always the same, even when she is not actually in prayer. If she is reading or speaking or occupied with work and domestic cares, she feels that she is less taken up with what she is doing than with God, and that he is really the secret occupation of her spirit. She goes simply as God leads her. If previously the soul desires to do this or do that, to seek this diversion or that relaxation or amusement, it does so no longer. If once it took the initiative in the interests and expressions of self, it now corresponds to the initiative of grace. And in doing so, it finds peace, the peace that lies in the will of him who moves the sun in heaven and all the stars. These accompanying effects and characteristics of common mystic prayer are experienced generally and in varying degrees. Much depends on the depth and progress of the prayer. But in any case, it gives proof of a powerful interior principle at work in the soul, which indeed becomes the soul's greatest treasure. 
giving it a distinct satisfaction in being able to live and be guided at this fine point of the spirit. It is evident that ordinary mystic prayer, whether dry or consoling, has unusual efficacy. As it comes to be the soul's habitual prayer, it is natural that it should reflect itself in diverse effects. In fact, this obscure prayer is felt more in its effects than in itself. It ever works towards transforming the soul into Christ, endowing it with the heart and mind of Him who is the source and the exemplar of all true holiness. The mind, enlightened by a simple spiritual wisdom, judges things supernaturally and in the light of eternal truth, with a penetration not possessed by carnal wisdom. The sensual man does not perceive the things that are of the Spirit of God, for it is foolishness to him, and he cannot understand, because it is examined spiritually. But the spiritual man judges all things, and he himself is judged by no man. For who has known the mind of the Lord, that he might instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2, 14-16. In the light of this wisdom, many faults and imperfections hitherto hidden are revealed to the soul. This inclines it to humility inasmuch as its true self is being unmasked, and it sees that it has nothing, is nothing, and can do nothing of itself. Besides, repeated falls have shown it its own helplessness and made it know the words of its Savior, Without me, you can do nothing. God's greatness, on the other hand, stands out clearer than ever. The soul sees that he is the Lord and Father of all, that nothing can endure without him, that it is he who spreadeth out the heavens as a tent to dwell in, and hath poised with three fingers the bulk of the earth, that he alone can join together the shining stars or put wisdom in the heart of man, and it wants to spend its being in singing the glories of this great God. Even more noticeable than the spiritual illumination of the mind is the touch of energy communicated to the will. Formerly the soul made resolutions again and again and failed in their fulfillment. Now it may seldom make a resolution, yet it steadily and easily observes the former ones. The senses have been weakened, and the higher faculties strengthened, so that the acts of virtue or self-denial are practiced with little effort. Moreover, the soul has now the general resolution of denying itself and serving God in everything, and this renunciation is not some manner of ascetic gymnastics, wherein may exist a preoccupation merely with the ways and means of perfection. Rather, the moving spirit is love, a love concerned not so much with a self-sought perfection as with a being to whom it feels the need of surrendering itself utterly. Thus, a great generosity is born of this spiritual prayer. The soul yields itself to God, realizing at last the implication of the great commandment. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy whole heart, and with thy whole soul, and with thy whole strength, and with thy whole mind. The wisdom God grants it forces it sweetly to seek its occupation, recreation, and happiness in Him alone. It is consequently unable to derive comfort and satisfaction elsewhere. Thus it lives by the single eye of faith, which makes the whole body lightsome to run in the way of the Lord. And since God is now refreshing the soul spiritually, it is fitting that it should lose the taste for other things, that it may sing with St. John of the Cross. He that is on fire with love, divinely touched of God, receives a taste so new that all his own is gone like one who of a fever ill loathes the food before him and longs for what I know not, which happily 
is found. Here's the reason for its loathing food of earthly desire, the fire of divine love, enkindling in the soul a longing, for it knows not what. It knows no name for it because it is an impression of faith without form or figure, not within the scope of mere sense knowledge. Yet in this intangible, indefinable something that secretly engages it, the soul recognizes its divine lover, whom it has truly found, and who nourishes in it the attraction of ever finding him in the peaceful repose of interior prayer. A settled peace, felt or unfelt, has come to it. The senses are mortified, the passions set in order. And as it perseveres and advances in its new way, it finds within itself a living hope in God which, says St. John of the Cross, fills the soul with such energy and resolution, with such aspiration after the things of eternal life, that all this world seems to it, as indeed it is, in comparison with what it hopes for, dry, withered, dead, and worthless. The soul now denudes itself of the garments and trappings of this world by setting the heart upon nothing that is in it, and hoping for nothing that is or may be in it, living only in the hope of everlasting life. And when the heart is thus lifted up above the world, the world cannot touch it or lay hold of it, nor even see it. When the soul sees itself in this happy disposition, living with a joy grounded upon nothing of this world but upon the hope of everlasting life, let it rejoice and be glad. And if it longs for heaven with at times a holy impatience, let it do so unabashed, yet abandoned to God, for it has found the pearl of great price. These are some of the effects wrought by interior prayer, and the consideration of them should help the soul over the difficulties, trials, desolations, feelings of insensibility and the like which accompany this prayer. What could be a surer sign of the soul's spiritual health than a longing for God, an inability to find comfort outside Him, a steady fear of displeasing Him, an attraction to prayerful solitude? Such a state is one of great grace and blessing, for which the soul, whether in sweetness or in desolation, sings its gratitude in the secret language of mystic prayer. End of chapter 12